Join Michael Voris in West Pleasant View, Colorado on January 19th for his talk on Light in the Darkness, the Splendor of the Catholic Faith and How to Live It. Click on the link for more information. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Vortex, where lies and falsehoods are trapped and exposed. I'm Michael Voris. At the end of the day, every moral problem that is vexing the West these days can be plopped right at the feet of religion. And there is something disingenuous going on in various religious groups, and especially among Catholics, and especially among Catholic leadership. That disingenuous activity is the refusal to argue these urgent social moral quagmires on their real terms. That at the end of the day, abortion, contraception, same-sex marriage, divorce and remarriage, adultery, that all of these are wrong because they violate the divine law. No one in the church, for example, really wants to talk in those terms. They're afraid. They're afraid to say the whole truth. So they argue moral questions at the end of the day with no reference whatsoever to the God who tells us what's moral and immoral. It's actually a pretty stupid strategy. You simply cannot and will not convince enough people that the satisfaction they get from having sexual encounters with whomever, however, as many people as they want, as many, wherever they want to go is bad because it will hurt the economy or government programs will have to bear the financial burden of the consequences or whatever. Those societal costs are simply too generic and out there to expect that people would change their behavior accordingly. Does anyone really think that two single people will decide to overcome their passions tonight and not engage in sexual activity because their action might eventually prove more costly for the federal government? So to try and argue that Americans should behave morally because immoral behavior is destructive of the culture, that argument's a waste of time. It's true, but it's meaningless when it comes to results. People need to experience a personal consequence to their bad actions, or they won't stop. And even then, many times we don't. And the more immediate the consequence, the more likely the chance that the behavior might change. And this is where religion comes in. In a culture that has become popularly, legally, and politically used to saying that religious beliefs are out of bounds when it comes to having a throwdown discussion on morality, the idea that an appeal to religion could be made is laughed out of the room. <laughs> And this is the suicidal potion that has existed in America since day one. The humanist and enlightenment scholars who represent a majority of the founding fathers had what could be termed a go-it-alone approach to morality, a belief that man can self-rule and choose the good unaided, that his reason would lead him to the right choice, and as such, religion then therefore became kind of a matter of indifference. Sure, the government should, be, should not be allowed to interfere with it, but neither should religion be allowed to gain any kind of foothold in the law, other than perhaps lip service. Yeah, yeah, we know that the Constitution is talking about establishing a state religion, a specific religion, not religion in general. But when you treat religion in general, what you end up with is a general religion. And it is this general religion, the idea of religion, that is now scorned and disregarded that cannot be appealed to when discussions of, for example, same-sex marriage come up. And the rationale behind the social banning of religion in these kinds of discussions is twofold. First, we can't talk about what God commands and doesn't command because we can't prove God exists. And two, if God does exist, we can't prove which religion is right. Those two points, the existence of God and the rightness of one religion over all the others, are the bugaboo topics. They are forbidden. They're boten in polite company. The tolerant crowd will allow any discussion, and any lifestyle will never allow this kind of discussion to be had, partly because they're afraid of the outcome and partly because they consider it a waste of time, because you can't take a piece of God and stick him yeah. under a microscope. The only truth for the culture today is scientific proof. The principles on which science rests, the laws of physics, for example, are superior to the author and creator of those laws, apparently. 
No matter how deep man drills down, there will always be the next layer of questioning. Why? Why does gravity work that way? Why do electrons behave in that manner? Why do gamma particles react in that fashion? And when those questions are answered, there will be even deeper questions about the newest set of answers. This cannot be a case of eternal question and answer. Ultimately, questions and answers terminate in the author of being himself. Scientists can't even answer the most rudimentary of questions. Why is there something rather than nothing? Why does anything exist at all? Why is there even existence? Science can't answer those questions because science doesn't have the tools. It's beyond their competence. But we know God exists, and virtually every person who's ever walked the earth knows this, at least instinctively. And if God exists, then the door is now flung open to the question of religion. And once that door is open, the even more specific question arises of which religion? Which one is right? Which one proclaims the truth? This is where discussions about the contraception mandate, for example, must be had. The immorality of abortion, the evil of same-sex marriage. For church leaders to try and couch these divine imperatives in the language of culture with glossed up terms like religious liberty and toleration and even natural law, those are good, but they're insufficient in themselves. The proof that they do not work is that they are not working. Religious leaders must tell it like it is. These things are evil, not just unconstitutional or <clears throat> violations of our cherished democratic principles. In many ways, those principles are what got us into this mess in the first place. They are rotten fruits from a fallen humanity and they end in total destruction, the second death. This is what must be said no matter how many howls and boots and slanders come pouring out of the culture. In order to say these things, though, the case must be made for God and His one holy Catholic apostolic church. Since this approach has been abandoned for so long by the very leaders who were consecrated to preach it, it's going to be one very heavy load to pick back up now. But it must be done. Let us pray that Catholic leaders get back to saying the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, not just bits and pieces. God love you. I'm Michael Voris. Take your family on a Lenten retreat at sea with Michael Boris and Father Z of the world-renowned Catholic blog, What Does the Prayer Really Say? Couples and singles can also cast off to the Caribbean for the seven-day trip, and those who have signed up are encouraged to introduce themselves ahead of time on our Facebook event page. To sign up for the cruise, please visit the website on your screen or call 805-526-6565. That's 805-526-6565.